Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. The title of this morning's message is Meals. Me- Stop it. Meals. Um, <laughs> you got me off track now. Meals, Miracles, and the Messiah. If I was going to put a title to it, as I was just looking at this passage, Meals, Miracles, and the Messiah. You know, we're looking at this idea in this series called Savage Jesus. Everybody likes very nice shepherd lamb Jesus, very nice pink shirt, you know, soft Jesus. But Jesus was also a savage, right? I mean, he said some things that kind of shocked people. He's not only the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's not a tamed lion. He's a fierce lion. He's an unpredictable lion, and he's a little wild at times. But he's always good, though. He is always good. The bottom line, Jesus wasn't about just being nice and sweet, but he was about changing mindsets, changing hearts, changing lives, changing our day-to-day walk, our day-to-day routines. He was about all those things and structures. He wasn't here to please culture. He was here to impact the culture. And sometimes you got to say something strong to get people's attention. Today, I want to look at the statement that Jesus said that actually shocked the people that were listening to him, it shocked them. So it just kind of blew them back. They actually stopped following him because of it. It's like, man, I got to get away from this guy. We'll take a look at that. Have you ever, have you, you know, they, these were halfway committed. He was exposing their motives. They were half-hearted, half-committed, following from a distant kind of disciples. They were followers, but they were following for uh, ulterior motives. And Jesus began to expose that. And after he made this savage statement, Many of them just stopped. Even some of the disciples actually stopped. Question, you ever stop following someone because you got offended at what they said? Right? (laughs) Like, man, I can't believe that, so I'm going to unfollow you on Facebook. I can't believe you said that. Cancel culture does that today. They think they can just do all kinds of stuff. They'll unfollow you. They'll fire you. They'll do all kinds of stuff. People just have their own way of making things up. Natalie told me the other day something that I really got upset about. And I'm like, man, I'm going to show you. I'm going I'm to silence you. You know, on, on, on iPhone 15, if you press this button, you can just silence them. That way, if they're trying to text you or call you again, you can't hear. You can't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't buzz or anything. I was like, I'll show you. I'm going to not only unfollow you on Facebook, I'm going to silence you. You can't talk to me that way, woman. <laughs> of course, she's still here, and I'm still here. <clears throat> but notice after this statement, the response that the people had after he makes the statement, John 6, 6, 6. And it was so true. And so from that time on, at the, the time when Jesus made this crazy statement, many of the disciples, they turned their backs on Jesus and no longer walked with him. Like, what in the world did he say that was so just like savage, so harsh, so strange? Actually, in verse 60, it says this. After the disciples heard this, they said, this is a tough teaching. It's too tough to swallow. This is a message translation. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this. And he said, does this rattle you completely? Are you you offended at this also? Do you want to leave also? And then Jesus, you know, starts talking to them. I don't know about you, but man, I'm telling you, you ever say anything so harsh that it rattled you or it rattled somebody else? It rattled the hearer? It's like, whoa, what the heck? Pastor's done that so many times, right? It's like, well, I can't believe he said that. You know Moses was a Mexican, right? <laughs> done stuff like that, right? It's like, what is he going to say now? But he really was a Mexican. I mean, who leads multitudes across the river to get to the promised land, right? (laughs) Anyways, what was it that Jesus said? (laughs) This is not going like I thought it was supposed to go. (laughs) What was it that he said that was so harsh that it shocked people? Thank you for asking. Look right here in verse 53 in John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, just imagine you being there. And then Jesus says this. Most assuredly, I say unto you, Brandy, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. 
crazy, right? In verse 66, it goes on to say, it says, from that time on, many disciples went back and walked with him no more. <laughs> and Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Why did he ask this? Why did Jesus, savage Jesus, make this statement? I always wondered when I was a first, uh, earlier on in Christians, like, what is he talking about? Cannibal Jesus. What is going on here? It's like, eat his flesh and drink his blood. That sounds, that's why Christians get a bad rap, right? It's like, don't go to that church. They hang snakes around here. They throw snakes around and all kinds of stuff. Especially with that Mexican pastor. You never know what's going to happen. <clears throat> the reason why he did it, he's wanted to expose motives. He wanted to expose what was going on in their hearts. It's okay to follow him, but you don't try to bargain with him, right? right? Earlier in the chapter, uh, we have to look at the context of this passage so you understand what's going on and why he said this statement. He did it as a, as a, shock, a shock value. But earlier, actually the day before, uh, Jesus wanted to have his disciples go and rest. They needed some rest. So he said, let's go rest a while. And they go and rest, but multitudes began following him. And so when the multitudes were there. Uh, he had an opportunity to feed them. And this is where the, the, the passages when he fed the 5,000. Remember when, it, when, when that passage, a couple of times he, he did that. This particular time, he fed the 5,000. So they got a free meal uh, that particular day. Now, the next day, these same multitudes, they didn't go back home. They waited there, and they continued to follow him. And the reason why they were following him is because they needed another meal. They wanted another meal. How do I say that? Because that's what Jesus said. Notice in verse 26, he says, Jesus replied, let me make this very clear. You came looking for me. Because I fed you a meal by a miracle, not because you believe in me. Right. Wow. He says, hey, you're here. You know, this is not the first WIC program, guys. All right? He goes, you're, you're, you're following me. I want you to follow me because I want you to believe in me and my father and who my father is. But you're following me for the wrong reasons. He says, you're following me because you need another meal. You know, in our most primitive state, human beings, we just want to survive. I mean, when it comes down just to the basic necessities of life, we just want, it's like, man, just, I wake up, I got to get food. I hunt, you cook, we eat. <laughs> right? I mean, it, really, that's just kind of how, how it is. You know, every Friday or Thursday, I can't remember, but every, every, um, every week there in McQueenie, I live in McQueenie, there is a flood of cars going down, it's about a mile long. I don't know if you guys, anybody ever seen those? It's like, what is happening over there? It's a drug bus. We don't know what's going on. Well, what it is, it's a food agency. They're, they're distributing food to those who are in need of food yeah. every single week. I mean, I got some free food over there. I, I was tempted to go. I didn't need any food, but I was tempted to see what kind of food they were giving away. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, I used to do a bunch of benevolence when I was an outreach pastor. And what I found out was whenever I would give banana boxes away, man, these guys would come and get them, but they'd go to the west side and sell them for 20 bucks. Right. Oh like, what in the world? Don't get any ideas, all right? But basically, people just want to survive. They'll do whatever they can to survive. So there's nothing wrong with receiving benevolence. What's wrong is when you're trying to bargain with God. Right. Hey, God, if you do this, I'll do this. God, if you just get me out of jail or just let me have probation, mm. I promise I'll go to church. Mm. You know, does that make sense? It's, it, there's something different when you're out seeking his hand without surrendering your heart. We got it. We got it. He's wanting us to believe, to trust him, to rely upon him, to follow him fully, to follow him wholly. He says, trust in the Lord, not with half of your heart, but with all of your heart. And those are the ones he's seeking. And he wants to make sure at some time in your life as a follower of Jesus, he's going he's gonna to put it down straight with you. He's going to say, hey, why are you here? Why are you following me? Why? Because he sees little pieces that need to be provoked to get us to surrender those things in our lives because he wants us holy. He came in to our house to move in. He knows what's in the attic. He knows what's in the basement. He knows what's in the bedroom. And throughout our whole, it's called the sanctification process of the Holy Spirit whenever you look at it theologically. He's trying to get us to give ourselves to him holy. Two reasons why these individuals were following him in that passage of scripture. One was because of a meal. The other one was because of a miracle. 
the meal, it says right there, like I said in verse 26, he came looking for me because I fed you with a meal. The miracle in verse 2, it says, great multitudes followed him because they saw the signs which he performed. Nothing wrong with signs, but you know what a sign's for, right? The sign, all of, the sign is for direction. The sign is to give you, to, to point you in a certain direction. And the signs that he was creating was to, to point people to him, to the person, Jesus himself. Why? Because he's the difference maker in our lives. Especially in this time of the season, man, what a great opportunity for us to share the gospel message, to share people about the goodness of Jesus in our lives. It brings me to a provoking question. Why do you follow him? Why are you following him? Like, come on, Marcus. Really? Why do you come to church? <clears throat> you know, as a pastor, if we're doing it for a while, I find two common traps that people follow him or people go to church in. One is networking, and the other one's not working. <laughs> it's true. I see this over and over from day one when we started. I became a young pastor, uh, um, outreach pastor at a church. I got our, we got our first invitation from a family to go have dinner with him. I was like, oh, man, look at him. This is, is kind of cool being a pastor. We didn't realize that all they were trying to do was get me to buy into their pyramid scheme so that they could get their whole downline taken care of because I was one of the pastors of the church. They were trying to network me. Like, what the heck? What's wrong with these people? <clears throat> Pastor, let me just, you really need this product. Let me add value to your lifestyle. You do this every week anyways. Why don't you just, you know, participate? Sign right here, and not only will you be taken care of, but anybody that you sign up will also be taken care of. Back then, it was Avon. <laughs> no, well, it was Amway, too. But I remember before that, it was Avon because my mom loved Avon. <laughs> and I couldn't say no to my mom's friend, Miho. Look, this is what you can get from Avon. It's like I had to trust her because I, mom told her about me. And then it was Amway. That time when that happened, that was Amway. Now, it's all other kinds of stuff. Premier jewelry, let's, you know, Pampered Chef and... Pastor in its body and beauty lotion, and here, put this cream on, and it'll take all the dimples off of your hail damage on your legs. <laughs> hey, pastor, I want you to meet so-and-so. Why? What's going on? It's horrible, right? I think that was like, what, what do they want, right? <laughs> like, I don't need any more friends. Really, I don't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what was I thinking about? All right, two common traps. One is networking. The other one is not working. That's why people follow him. Something's not working. Their marriage is not working. Let's go to church. Their finances aren't working. Man, maybe, you know, let's just, let's just go to church. Maybe God will do something. You know, their, their relationships aren't working. The lawyer's not working. The teenagers, Jesus, just fix this. I promise I'll go to church. I love how he exposed motives. Back to the story, though, right? Back to why this passage was written. Jesus was pointing to their short-sightedness. When you look at this passage, he was pointing to something that was a whole lot more important than just food. Physical bread is very important for us to sustain our lives, right? But spiritual food is what's necessary, what's really of greater value. And that's why he gave him that shock value. Notice right here in verse 27, it says, Why do you strive for food that is perishable and not be passionate to seek the food of eternal life, which never spoils? I, the Son of Man, am ready to give you what matters most, for God the Father has destined me for this purpose. Man, he turns their perspective, and this is, this is what I'm challenged with this week. Uh, he turns their perspective from something physical to something spiritual, which is of really the most value in our lives. We look at this world, you know there's another world. There's another world that's actually more real. It's a spiritual world. And how we conduct that realm will affect what we experience here in this physical realm. When we put a spiritual uh, component first in our lives, the earthly things, they'll still happen, but they won't impact you and affect you like they do if we're just focused on the natural realm. The flesh profits nothing. Nothing in this world that can... Um, people try to give me or try to persuade me to buy into nothing in this world satisfies. 
But when I got a hold of Jesus and Jesus got a hold of me, I don't need anything else. And he's basically t- trying to tell them that, right? Because what you're looking for is stuff in the natural. Ladies, let me just say this. What you're looking for is not a man to cuddle you. What you're looking for is a man who loves Jesus more than he would ever love you. I'm just saying. Same thing with men. Men, what you're looking for is not found in the spouse or the chick or whatever, that secretary or that extra person you're meeting on the side. What you're really looking for is something that just completes you on the inside, that understanding that you are known by him and you're accepted by him. Amen. Amen. The spiritual is always more important. He loves you more than anything else. Notice right here in verse 51 and 53, he says, I alone am the living bread that has come to you from heaven. If you eat this bread, you'll live forever. The living bread I give you is my body, which I will offer as a sacrifice so that all may live. Can you continue? These words of Jesus sparked an angry outburst among the Jews, and they protested, saying, does this man expect us to eat his body? Cannibal. Jesus replied to them, listen to this eternal truth. Unless you eat the body of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have eternal life. Is that it? So basically what he was saying, even though it was a shock valve, he says, eating this body and drinking this blood is equivalent to believing and trusting and relying upon me and who my father is. I want you to get to know him more than anything else. And you're following me because of your own selfish motives, but I want you to follow me because this is who the true father is. It's an outward expression of the love that you found out that God has for you. (coughs) Man, I love that about him. Placing my eternity in the work of Christ and not my own works, not my accomplishments, not my successes, not my failures, not any of those things. My my work and my satisfaction, my peace inside is based upon that he first loved me, therefore I will love him out of that place. I know it's a simple message, isn't it? My point this morning is this. Meals and miracles will never satisfy. They won't sustain you. The Messiah will. The Messiah will. It's like, Pastor, I know that. Well, I just want to remind you of that. For me, the application of this whole passage of Scripture, even though it was a savage statement, is, is this. Remember what matters most, Marcus. This holiday season, as I enter into this holiday season, I always reflect, I always recalibrate and kind of just approach this season uh, on level ground. And to help me understand that when I'm among all the people, whether it's in the city with my own parents, with my own, you know, cousins, with my own family members, people I like, people I don't like, whenever I'm around them, what matters most is this, not physical presence, but spiritual presence, but his presence being a part of my life. And me trying to figure out how can I reflect the father's character and nature here on this earth, regardless of what environment I find myself in. Make sense? And that's the challenge for all of you guys, is walk slowly through the crowd that you will be in front of this holiday Christmas. And, you know, my word this year um, is appear. And every year I I get a word, and because God always uses that word to break me and to shape me and to mold me. This year, it was appear. And what that meant to me was, Marcus, I need you to appear. Places you don't want to go, places you feel uncomfortable with, places you're invited to, I need you to appear. It's like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go be a part of the parade up here. I don't want to, there's a lot of things because I would rather just stay at home by myself and just hang out there and play golf or do something. But there's so many things. He's pulling me out. Now they took me on this trip a couple weeks ago. Man, we were at all these places. It's like a lot of people, a lot of rich people, a lot of crazy people, a lot of stuff going on. And I'm like, I'm so uncomfortable, but I will appear. And I am so thankful that I appeared because I had opportunities to just share. Because it's awkward for me. It's like, hey, what do you do? I'm a pa- Hey, I heard you're the pastor of the church. Like, yeah, the conversations all change after that. Oh, I'm just a, I'm just a writer. That's what I tell them. I'm a, I'm a spiritual communicator. Oh, really? They get into all the Zen stuff, whatever. But whenever I say I'm a pastor, I'm like, oh. 
silence. <laughs> or I got a confession to make. <laughs> I'm like, well, $20, buddy. No. <laughs> Get all the kids' gifts, have fun with them, but include the greatest gift story that they would ever experience in life. Make sense? Be savage about it too. Whenever you're representing who the father is, what do I mean be savage about it? Man, pick out the kid, the wife, not that you have two, the, the neighbor, the person that don't deserve anything and show them and express God's love to them. <laughs> the neighbor you don't like because his dog keeps getting in your trash Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Bless him. Buy him another dog. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Give him the best one. Because that's what he did for you. We were all messed up, weren't we? Even in our ruined state, he still chose to love us and just display his love for us. This week, like I said, I was so mad at Natalie. She said something to me that really, really offended me. I'm not going to tell you. Well, she, I'll, I'll tell you because it's kind of fun now. It's kind of, we're laughing about it now. Because we were simply communicating about two different things. And there was a major misunderstanding. And she's like, you liar. I'm like, what? I'm not a liar. I said, I actually cussed. I'm like, pastor, I know. But at least I'm confessing it. I actually cussed and I got so upset at what she said. Not only did I unfollow her and silence her. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe that she said that. And here, here's, here's the crazy thing. This is pastor confession morning. I wasn't shocked at what I said. What I was shocked about was how long I had let that thing inside of my heart that when a little pressure comes, that's what came out. It's not what comes out of a man that defiles a man. It's what's inside, right? So I'm like, man, Lord, how long has that thing been in there? That that was my first response. Because it really, it, it kind of just threw me off also. Except I just put a mad face on and then I realized, like, man, Lord, even though I had this inside of me, you exposed it through this little Mexican girl because you will not leave me the same. You want me to grow. You want me to get better. You want me to get stronger. So thank you. I honor you for that. Amen. And this passage, this particular passage, I read at the very last verse of this passage, I saw that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's exactly the the message, the gospel message. Notice right here what it says right there in verse 70 of chapter 6. Jesus shocked them with these words again. I have handpicked you to be my 12. He says, man, I have specifically chosen you to follow me, even though I know one of you is the devil. And that's how he expresses his love. Even him knowing what's inside of us, the impure thoughts, the phoniness, all this stuff, yet he still, to the very end, expresses his love towards us. That's who our Father is. And so you might have walked into this place just feeling bad about what you've done or what you've, you know, thought about doing or, you know, the mess-ups or whatever, but I want you to know that he still has aggressive love towards you. But he also wants to just make sure that you understand that, hey, I see you, I see you in that condition, and I'm still willing to give you my everything. Trust me. Amen. That's the gospel message. So this morning, I want to receive communion with all of us. I hadn't received communion with you guys in a while, so I wanted to close this service with communion together. Is that okay? And I don't know, Jeremiah, if you're here, can you just get the band back up and sing whatever song you want to sing? And we can all stand. <clears throat> You should have received, if you haven't received the communion elements, just lift up your hand and the ushers will get those to you. Oh, thank you, man. Are you guys okay this morning? Savage Jesus.
Man, I love this church. Just want you to know I love you guys. Y'all are amazing people. Some of y'all are crazy. <laughs> and so am I. <laughs> oh, God. Father, you're so good to us. Lord, we take this moment to, by the way, the way we have just free expression to receive communion here at Crossroads. In other words, you don't have to pay penance. Uh, you know your condition. God knows your condition. And we are reminded of what Jesus did in the past, how he made a sacrifice for us. He paved the way so we could have forgiveness and freedom the rest of our lives. And that's why we receive communion. We evaluate our lives today, make our adjustments, not by paying penance, but just by uh, repenting and asking God to forgive us. And then we are thinking about the futures like, man, one day, those who want went before us and we're going to get to meet them one day and we're going to forever be with the Lord and celebrate together. We're going to be reunited with our loved ones and there will never be another separation again. So that's what communion is for us. So we offer that to anyone. And so, Father, we are so thankful that you took this bread and you broke it and you gave thanks and you said, take and eat. This is my body that was broken for you. And when we do this, do it in remembrance of you. Let's go ahead and partake together. Father, we thank you that you not only shed blood, but you offered your whole body as a sacrifice to redeem our lives from destruction. And so we take that heart. Any animosity, any stuff that we have towards the body of Christ, we ask that you'd forgive us. We repent of those things, and we just make things right here moving forward in Jesus' name. And he also took the cup and in the same manner. He said, this cup is my blood that was shed for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. And when you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. Let's go ahead and partake together. And Lord, we're so thankful also that, man, the covenant that you have, it's still, the blood of Jesus is still warm on the mercy seat. It still testifies of forgiveness and freedom and deliverance. So we put our trust in you and we are so thankful. And Father, I just pray that you would just help us as a family as a community, as we go to the parade, as we spend this next December, Lord God, just loving you and loving others, Lord God, that we can just reflect who you are and what you've done for this whole world. So we just put our trust in you. We thank you for it. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday or Thursday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.